breakfast puppies? This podcast contains adult language and content and is meant for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Okay, man. Roll a saving throw versus listening to the Glitter Boys. Righteous. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Welcome back, Kevin. Good to be back. Good to have you back. You you really, 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 really got my brain spinning when we called the other day to try to get you on. And I'm really, really, really glad that we could all make this time work and hear stories of how it all began. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's I think it's kind of fun and interesting and most people aren't familiar with it. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to blither on as much as you guys want. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. I was... I was so sad that I missed the last one, but I am really excited to be here today. I get to hear the the early days of Palladium, and and th- that's what I really want to hear today. If if that's all right, I'd I'd like to hear what what led up to you deciding that you know I I have this great great game, I have this great group, I have this great idea. I want to take this and make something of it myself. And I, I I'd love to hear that process today, where where you were, the people that were around you at that time, and kind of the the trials and tribulations of starting your own your own game absolutely and just in case somebody is out there actually listening and doesn't know who you are give us a quick introduction (laughs) on this podcast (laughs) (laughs) yeah um well hi everybody i uh, first let me apologize i've got a head cold so i'm a little uh raspy and nasal but uh i'm kevin sambita i'm the founder and publisher and chief game designer at palladium books We've done games like uh, Palladium Fantasy, Heroes Unlimited, Robotech, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Other Strangeness, uh, Rifts, um, Beyond the Supernatural, uh, Ninjas and Super Spies, uh, and a whole lot more. Been doing this for about 43 years now. Yeah, and in my, my start goes back in, you know, very much to the early days. I, I think I discovered role-playing in 19, like, the winter of 78 or the spring wow. of yeah, so it was early on. I, I was working at an art supply shop, and uh, one of my buddies there, one of my co-workers, Julius Rosenstein, who would later come to work for me, he had discovered role-playing and was all excited about it and kept telling me about it and kept saying, oh, Kev, you would love this. And I'm like, I don't know. It sounds kind of stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it did. It sounded kind of goofy to me. And he's like, no, no, you would love it. You would love it if your imagination. And I'm like, Okay, so uh, he finally got me and, and like three or four other co-workers to join this other guy's campaign. And then looking back at it, at the time, I thought the guy was a jerk. But looking back at it, because, I, I mean, he just, he didn't really do anything. To, the game master didn't really do anything to accommodate us. Mm-hmm. We just got there, you know, uh, not knowing what to do. And every time we wanted to do something, you know, one of the other players were like, don't worry, little little first level thief we'll take care of this. i'm like when i want to do something <laughs> no, no no you're too fragile right right <laughs> i mean first of- first level thieves yeah. are pretty fragile <laughs> no they sure are uh, i mean you get hit slap card by by an ogre you're dead yeah <laughs> I mean, you probably i probably had five or seven hit points for god's sakes i i looking back at it, i realized the guy first of all Julius has kind of foisted us upon him and he was running. He already had like four or five regular players and now you're adding another <laughs> four or five. A lot mm-hmm. of people can't handle a large group. And uh, so anyways, in the next two games I played just sucked. And I'm like, yep, just what I thought, <laughs> stupid. You know, I didn't want to play anymore. And Julius was like, Kev, why don't you let me just run you and, and your our, our three co-workers I'll run a game just with you guys, see what you guys think. And I'm like, I don't know. I think I'm done with this. And and, then the other guys were like, well, if you don't play, we're not going to play. I'm like, what is this, grade school? (laughs) Well, it's like, what the hell? And I didn't want to hurt Julius's feelings. So I said, okay, I'll I'll play. So we play this game, this, this adventure, and it's, 
freaking great. We're, we're up against gnolls and all kinds of stuff, and I'm doing cool shit. Like I carved up my thief, carved up this this staff, just you know, horseshit images and emblems and that mm-hmm. meant nothing. And I was able to bluff orcs because you know they're like a superstitious lot the way Julius was playing them anyway. Right. And uh, I was able to bluff them, you know, if they'll oh, beware the staff or whatever. <laughs> and, and it was great. And then, you know, my, my fellow players were, were stupid. So, like, one guy's holding a door so it doesn't work. Another one's doing this. Who are they sending in to check out the treasure <laughs> chest? Uh, <laughs> so, of course, my character is over the, the box. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And they're like, what do you see? What do you see? And I'm like, oh, well, hold on. And my thief is stuffing all kinds of shit in his <laughs> You know, I walk out jingling. <laughs> right, right, right. But all that was there, and they're like, uh-huh. <laughs> but anyways, we're getting chased out the dungeon, and uh, we get out, and it was awesome. It was a great adventure. And I turn to Julius, and I say, I open up the door, and I flip off <laughs> the nose. Shoop! <laughs> right inside arrow. And Julie's like, how many hit points you have left? Oh, and he had like seven. Yeah. You know, start. And I took some damage. I'm like, uh, three. And he's like, oh, you're dead. And I'm like, I'm dead? What do you mean I'm dead? You know, one of those guys, newbie, right? And, and he's like, well, you shouldn't have done that. It was really stupid. You got away. And, and then you open the door and you put the wall off. And that rolls going on. And it happens. And, and I'm like... This is great. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So that I, that that uh, brings a question to my mind. Uh a lot of the early folks from that, you know, 77, 78, 79 period, not all of them, but a lot of them uh came from wargaming. Had you been a wargamer at all prior to your introduction to role-playing, or are you one of the people who came across as uh, just having a creative, wild imagination? Um, I, I think it's the latter, uh, unless you count Risk. I had discovered Risk just a few years prior and fell in love with it. But no, I was not a wargamer a- at all. So it was just this whole new concept. And uh, anyways, I loved it. And Julia started running games. And then he introduced me to his, uh, he was part of a group called the Wayne Ware Gamers at Wayne State University. Mm-hmm. Eric Woodjick was also um, a member of uh, the Wayne Ware Gamers. And so I met Eric and his crew. And they were all pretty smart, creative people and uh, played in a couple of games with him. And then Eric, you know, it's like myself, we just had that kind of entrepreneurial leaning and he's like yeah kev i always had this idea to, to start a you know like a detroit gaming center and i'm like "Ooh, that'd be great mm-hmm. Let, let's do that so we had a couple like false starts off campus and then we, we found this uh, uh what used to be a methadone clinic it gives you an idea of what a great neighborhood we are in <laughs> oh. it was like this ten thousand square foot area upstairs and uh, we rented it, and we started the Detroit Gaming Center. There had already been a big group uh, in the area called uh, the Detroit Metro Gamers, and they were running what they called WinterCon and SummerCon mm-hmm. at Oakland University. And they were a pretty big group. For some reason, Detroit was, at the time, just really into gaming. There were a lot of people. When I say, you know, a lot, I mean, this is, you know, 1979, and... Wintercon, Summercon would have 1,500 to 2,000 people. Mm-hmm. That's a lot for a little local con, even oh, yeah. today. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I thought it was all pre- pretty cool. And then the, the really neat thing about the gaming center was that it was sort of this hot house environment. So I got to see, so first of all, everyone there who was there on a regular basis got to see everything that came out new. Because mm-hmm. somebody would walk through the door with, you know, look what I got. Is the latest D&D adventure source book, or it's a Judges Guild mm-hmm. thing about that door. And, and, and it's like, okay, cool. And then the other really cool thing was you got to see all these different styles of play. Mm-hmm. So, for example, Matt, I'm sure you, 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 you play very, you know, differently than NPC and, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, and, uh, and maybe not, but I mean, you know, you got to see all these. And some people played really like even Eric Woodjack. Eric mm-hmm. would watch some of my games, and he was like in, in awe because I would let my players know if they dug up the information, they took the time to find things out. 
I would give them everything. I mean, they knew exactly what they were going up against. And I think part mm-hmm. of that for my comic book roots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in comic books, you'd know they kind of set up the villains. And, yeah. and Eric was convinced I, I created the best villains <laughs> the, 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 you know, on the planet. And, and part of that is, you know, you let them know what it all is. While Eric's approach was, he was more a, a puzzle and mystery guy. Mm-hmm. And he played it so tight where if you didn't actually draw a map, <laughs> and you were going through, and you said, I want to go back to that room. And he's like, well, do you know where it is? <laughs> and they're like, uh, I think so. You think so? Do you have a map? <laughs> uh, and, you know, and I, I played... Uh, a bit more fast and loose. And so my guys knew everything. But the thing is, what, what, what Eric quickly realized is that set up this vast anticipation. Because, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you know, you know you're going up against Thanos, and you know you're going up against this or that, just to use that as a common analogy. So, so you had a clear idea of what you're, you're going to go up against, and then you could really plan and kind of figure that out. And so it, it was awesome. It was fun, and that's where I, I experimented a little bit. You had asked me about war gaming. I, I, I fooled around a little bit with some war games uh, at the gaming center, but I really love role playing. I love that story, mm-hmm. helping the characters and stuff. And so I started. You know, my my game was was really uh, popular, and I was running D and D. And then there was a bunch of stuff I didn't care about D and D, and that's not to slam Dungeons and Dragons, because you know some people like to, and, and some people. You know, it's like whatever your favorite game company, everyone else is no good. Poo poo. And that, yeah. I don't, I don't ascribe <laughs> to that. You know, if there wasn't D and D, there'd be no game industry. There'd be no yeah. other. I hit my favorite game company is this company or that. We wouldn't exist. So I give them credit where it's due. You know, and it's obviously popular. It's good to test the time. I mean, there's been a million versions of it, but there is that. Yeah. Anyways, I didn't care for a lot of the stuff that they did. It was a little too. I think rulesy as opposed to role playing. So I started to make changes, um, a, a lot of changes. And then because I didn't like to, uh, I don't like to disappoint people. Every time someone new came and said, Hey, are you running this great fantasy game? Can I play? I'd be like, Yeah, sure. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I'm running 26 players. <laughs> Lord, Lord. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, thankfully, we're, you know, we're crazy 20-somethings, so we'd start playing at 7 o'clock in the evening. On, on yeah. Sunday. Oh, yeah. And like 8 or 9 in the morning Sunday. Yep, yep. Oh, man. Power of youth and caffeine. <laughs> well, it, well, it was great, and I had to come up with, you know, ways to do really fast, fast ways to run so people, you know, keep their interest. Mm-hmm. And then the cool thing, and I've talked about this here and there in the past, but but the way you can, the reason you can run that many people, uh, if you can keep it all in your head, which I, I could, is again I think I drew from my comic book background. Uh, originally, I wanted to be a comic book artist writer, and also my mom my mom had cancer, and uh, I would go and visit her every day for like two hours, and we'd watch her favorite soap operas. And so, first of all, for a large group, just like at a party they tend to splinter off into faction. So these six guys are doing this. These two guys are doing that. These eight guys mm-hmm. are doing this other thing. And then you use sort of the comic book and, and soap opera trope of, you know, you're, I kicked in the door, what I see? You see this horrible vampire leering at you. NPC, what's your group doing? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love doing that. Yeah. And the cool thing would be they would, you know, by the time I got back to say your group NPC, you guys have had that 20, 30 minutes while I was dealing with these other three groups to think about exactly what you guys wanted to do. So I get back to you and you're like, this guy's like, oh, I'm drinking my potion of this. I'm pulling my fire sword of that. I'm pulling out my, you know, and they're all ready to go. Not that it necessarily helped them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, it was my guys who convinced me that uh because i didn't even think about it they're like hey kev you know your your game it's really not D D anymore i mean you've taken made so many changes and we love it have you ever thought about you know doing formalized rules um and trying to sell it 
So I, I kind of formal, formalized the rules, especially the psionic combat system and the combat system, the character generation and, you know, the armor rating, you know, a lot, a lot of basic core things in the Palladium game system, which I felt were more intuitive, especially in the time. Like it always, conf- I'm not a math guy. So it always confused me, you know, when I'm playing D&D and I've got this armor and if it's, if the number is lower, it's better. Mm-hmm. And this to that and i'm like just you know make it simple i need to roll above this or that to hit yep and so uh they convinced me to go try to sell it and you know i again i'm 20 something i get you know i'm full of piss and vinegar so i I actually called tsr at one point (laughs) and and said hi your art sucks (laughs) i I could be your new art director (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) <laughs> I'm a gamer, right, punk? And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, punk Detroit talk. gaming. That's it fantastic. Back then. No offense, TSR people, <laughs> but you know it was it was pretty crude. And, uh, and and I have to say that whoever was on the phone was actually very nice <laughs> and said, uh, I, you know. Um, I don't think we're looking for an art director right now. <laughs> but you need one. And I'm your guy. And they're like, well, that's okay. So then, uh, you know, these, these winter cons, summer cons by Detroit Metro Gamers, they were pretty big. And they had a lot of uh, the big companies of the day there. Um, and, and they had guys, because, you know, it was just this infant industry. So you had mm-hmm. the guys who ran the company uh, often at the booth, which was cool. Bob Bledsoe from Judges Guild was there and oh you know the Akinto people and all the, all these folks. And I I took my my you know game pitch to every company that was there, probably 30 different companies. And uh, you know, most of them was like, you know, thanks kid, go away kind of thing. And uh Bob Bledsoe at Judges Guild was the only one who made me an offer. And, uh, you know, Bob's pitch was, I'll give you 500 bucks. I'll give you a 2% royalty that goes down to 1% after we sell 10,000 copies. And, uh, and I'm like, well, if you sell 10,000 copies, especially quick, shouldn't that be like, go up, not, not, not down. And he's like, nope, that's, that's the best deal I give you kid. And I'm like, well, um, no, thanks. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and he did hire me as an artist because uh, I also showed him my portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd go on to do work for Judges Guild artwork for like the next uh, next six months, knocked out like 400 and some illustrations. Bob had a very sweatshop kind of mentality, so I had to knock out 72 illustrations a month. Yeah. Oof. You know, now a lot of those were half page and quarter page, but but still I had to do like 20 or 25 or 30 Mm -hmm. full page illustrations and like 10 of those are supposed to be cover quality Mm -hmm. and i was getting paid get this 15 dollars for a full page art (laughs) so you know i'm like after like four or five months i had it was funny i had my brother ghosting for me my my buddy alex um (laughs) would go on to become sort of a famous comic book guy they would do pencils for me and I would ink them or I'd do, do the pencils and they would ink them. And it, it was kind of crazy just to meet my deadline and stuff. And I'm walking up in my, my mom and dad's attic that didn't have unfinished attic, didn't have heat. <laughs> in Detroit. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm like something out of, you know, a Dickens novel. I've got the <laughs> fingers cut off and, you know, you can see the, my breath, <laughs> you know, it's like, Eric Woodchuck came and visited me one day, and he's like, "Jesus, Kev, <laughs> please, sir, can I have another scoop yeah, of just, coal?" Coal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just picturing Bob dressed up as as Ebenezer Scrooge now. <laughs> so what you're saying is you drew a lot of ducks. <laughs> so yeah, I did a lot of art. You know, I also did some art for Steve Jackson games for his uh, mm-hmm. cardboard miniatures. Um, I did a little bit of stuff for FASA um, when they were still doing other game companies before they launched all their stuff. I did a, I did art for a Traveler source book or two. Oh, really? 
and uh, they really like my 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 stuff. And uh, I don't know, NPC, if you wanted this to be mentioned later in it's, it's some other episode, but I was actually the first guy they approached to do battle droids. Oh, yeah. Battle. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah. Tell us all about that. And uh, so I'm at some trade show. I want to say it was the American Book Sailor Association. I had already been doing art for Judges Guild, and I had done, a, again, that, that, that's a, a source book or two for uh, FASL. Mm-hmm. And they really, really liked my work. Um, they were familiar with mechanoids. You know, that, that kind of put me on the map, especially as an artist. Uh, so we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit. Sorry, guys. No but, uh, so uh, they loved the mechanoids, and they wanted me to do the art. So they show me uh, images of, of, you know, the Macross cartoon. And they're like, we have mm-hmm. the right to these images. And I'm like, really? That's amazing. Through 21st Century Imports, which was a model kit mm-hmm. import company. And uh, I'm like, wow, this stuff looks really great. Uh, and he gave me a bunch of little snap together model kits that I still have to this day for for Macross. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm very, and they're like, we want you to do our mech design, you know, mech designs, you know, mm-hmm. you want, they'll be based on these at first. And then, you know, you'll be able to create your own. And I'm like, great. And they wanted to pay me $60 a page. And I'm like, oh, drawing mechs is a pain in the ass. It's a lot of work, very time consuming. Cause you know, when you're drawing human figures and monsters mm-hmm. and stuff, you know, it's very organic. You don't need clean, sharp lines to do convincing mecha. You need to have very sharp lines. So you're using rulers and templates and mm-hmm. curves and making sure those lines are very sharp and clean. And it just takes a long time. And, and I don't particularly enjoy doing a lot of that kind of work says the guy who illustrated uh, contemporary weapons and like <laughs> and guns. So I said, no, man, I got, I got to get at least a hundred dollars. And they said, no, the best we can do is 65. And I said, I'll, I'll pass. Yeah. But again, it was just one of those weird moments in my life. And there's been several of them mm-hmm. where what if I had done the art for battle tech? Cause I mean, that's yeah. what battle droids became. Mm-hmm. You know, what I had been one of FASA's first main artists, what I've continued to do my own thing, because I was freelancing to help pay the bills while yeah. I was doing my own company. So anyways, 1979, 1980, I, sh- I shopped my game around. No one wanted it. So I went back to my guys and said, yeah, I shopped it around, and no one wants it. I, and I told them the judges guild off, and I said, you know, for $500, I, I'll just sit on it. I'm not going to do this. They're like, but Jeff, this is too good. Your game is too good. You got to do something. They said, hey, you have publishing experience. Because I, I had done a, I had done a uh, comic book mm-hmm. with Alex Marcinison and I, Megaton Publications. Not the one that's more well-known. Someone else took that name later. But in like 1976, we did a series of black and white comic books. And my guys knew that, and they're like, "But you have publishing experience, you know. And you worked for a magazine, you know. You could do this yourself." Mm-hmm. And I'm like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> for those in audio format, he is nodding right now. <laughs> <laughs> I had this publishing bug. Um, I had worked on a bunch of fanzines. I had published a couple of fanzines that went nowhere. One of them, by the way, called Night Spawn. Oh. <laughs> and and the logo, just like this logo, is by Tom Orzakowski, mm-hmm. who went on to do uh, the 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 logo and lettering for Spawn since its inception, and did a bunch of stuff for Marvel Comics. And you know, I was keeping that name Night Spawn for something special, and uh, mm-hmm. I waited too long. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's that's a story for a later episode. <laughs> but anyways, I I just. Once they planted that seed in my head, and I'm like, I, I could publish this. And so what, what most people don't realize is Palladium Fantasy was my first game. It was the first game that I designed and completely wrote and had most of the artwork done. Um, you know, I, I was a poor kid in Detroit and couldn't really afford to hire people. So, uh, which is why the Mechanoid, when it came out, had, and I'm not kidding you, it averaged, if I do recall correctly, 20 typos a page. <laughs> <laughs> not a great scholar. It was before spell check days, right? And editing costs money. <laughs> yeah. 
mammal. Who knew? Mammals have two M's in it. So, <laughs> and, I, and I use that word a lot, apparently. Um, so I really want to do Palladium Fantasy. I really wanted to do it as, as a book. Originally, I investigated it as a hardcover. Mm -hmm. But that was super expensive back then. I couldn't afford that. And I couldn't afford to do a box. And I looked at box games anyways, and I thought, you know, you're paying all this money for a box at the time, especially printing it in the United States. You're paying, you know, seven, eight dollars for that box, mm -hmm. you know, and then the, the publication inside would be, you know, this flimsy mm -hmm. magazine thing with some cheap dice. And, and I'm like, do we really need that? What if we just did it as a book? And at the time in the trade, it was known as trade paperbacks mm -hmm. or soft cover. The whole perfect bound is what most people know it as now. The whole perfect bound soft cover book that was a new concept back in the in the 70s and, and early 80s and so i found a company uh actually several companies that could do soft cover books and that was great except i couldn't afford that either mm -hmm. um, i mean i just didn't have the money i needed like a solid 10 or 12 grand just to print it as a soft cover book five or six thousand copies and i didn't have that mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. And Eric said, well, Kev, why don't you just come up with something else and, you know, something smaller or even release Palladium Fantasy in a series of books. And I'm like, no, it really to have the full impact of Palladium Fantasy. It's got to be one big, juicy book. So he was like, why don't you do something else then? And that's when I came up with The Mechanoids. And uh, it's a, it's what is it, a 48 or 64 page, 48 page, you know, little game in itself so many typos that i had to do an, an immediate oops sheet <laughs> back and in the days of oops sheets i remember those <laughs> so that's a quick question for you uh for because a lot of people probably don't know this which came first the mechanoids comic or the mechanoids role-playing game the mechanoids role-playing game okay <laughs> oh, no, he's got the comics. Yeah. It was supposed to be a six issue series or 12 issue and published by Caliber Press. Yeah. Yeah. And I knew Gary Reed, the publisher. We were good friends. And uh, he's the guy, by the way, who first published The Crow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Baker Street and some other. He discovered some pretty big name. I think people. they also did Negative Burn, which was a good one. I What's went, that? I, went, I think they also did a series called Negative Burn. Which was kind of I like a, so, yeah, yeah. That was and, one of my favorites. And uh, they did Dead World, I think it was called, and they did a bunch of cool stuff. He yeah. had he had quite a concern going, but that came out in the uh, that came out in the eighties or, or late eighties, uh, early nineties. Let's 90s. see, this one I think. What is the date on this? Does it even have a date? Eighty six, nineteen ninety. Well, oh, 1990. Yeah, yeah. This no. Well, okay. It has an ad for Rifts, so I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be 88 80, or 90. Yeah. Yeah. Then I thought it came out much later. Yeah, so, yeah. the Mechanoid Invasion came out in 1981. Mm -hmm. So I was telling NPC when we were talking, it was, was kind of wild because I go to my first Gen Con, and it's just me and my buddy Matthew Ballant, who was also a Detroit Gaming Center guy. And we had this and we had this. This was his Oh yeah. Weapon. Oh yeah, the, the old book. the old the weapons. Weapons. Cover weapons. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. This is comic book size newsprint, mm -hmm. which is why it's all yellowed. Mm -hmm. And uh it's a relic. Know, this was like eight and a half by eleven folded in half. Oh and people familiar with our weapon series will recognize. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the only, the that, only ones I have are these. The well, I, yeah. this would spawn those those later later books. Yeah, I got the two castles because I like castles. <laughs> so I, I learned. So for every one mechanoid I would sell, Matt would sell four or five of these. Oh, <laughs> and granted, <laughs> you know this was a buck or or you know, I guess we sold for four bucks. Mm -hmm. Four bucks. You know, I'm selling this for three ninety five. So I learned first of all, don't under or three seventy five because I could produce it cheap. This cost me like thirty two cents to make, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I'll sell it cheap. 
And by selling it cheap, a lot of people go, ooh, I can get this cheap, I'll buy it. No. <laughs> the movement had a thousand people say, sounds kind of cool. 375, what's wrong with it? Yeah. It was too What cheap. a strange question to say about a book. <laughs> what's wrong with it? Well, you know, most, most game books at the time were selling for around 10 bucks. Yeah. And it was just, you know, and here it's a complete game. And, you know, people were just not buying it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, with this little weapon book, you know, it's before the uh, the Internet. You know, if I say, what's a flamberge? A lot of people don't know. You say, hey, you know, what's a polearm? Most people don't know. You know, what's a halberd? You know, it's a type of polearm. Most people don't know. And Matt realized that at the gaming center. He was a history buff. Oh. So he spent, like, I don't know, at least two years compiling all this crap which was super, super useful. And even though the drawings were very simple, mm -hmm. they're, they're really effective. And the little dash marks show you exactly where the blade is. It told you how heavy it was. It told mm -hmm. you whether it was a single hand or, or you know, double-handed weapon. And uh, with the popularity of D&D, &D, this sucker was selling like crazy. So we get back from Gen Con, and I'm like, man, we got to do something with this. This, this is a potential gold mine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, you know, Mechanoids is doing all right, but it's, I only have a couple of distributors. And and I said, why don't we, I said, can you expand it? And he's like, well, I don't know. I've got like 700 weapons, that little book. <laughs> I, I don't know how much more I can expand it. I mean, I'm sure there's some stuff I haven't included. And I said, well, what if we did armor? We kind of gave it the same mm -hmm. treatment where we point out the different types of armor and how they work and all that. And he loved the idea, and uh, we came out with weapons and armor. That's the first version of it. Yeah. Oh, the green and white cover. And then we came out with, you know, weapons and castles. And then Woodjick did, you know, weapons and assassins. And uh, we did exotic weapons and weapons of an orient and, and all kinds of stuff. You know, of course, today, now they're, you know, they're nice, pretty little perfect bones mm -hmm. with color covers. But the... Uh, Armor's we Weapons and Armor book was our first quiet mega hit. Uh, we, we sold like 100,000 copies in four or five years. Wow. Back I mean, in the yeah. day, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were huge. We, we had them in libraries. We had them mm -hmm. in schools. Uh, it, it, was it was pretty neat. So that, that was cool. But, you know, we're still, you know, we weren't selling those for a gazillion dollars either. and. Um, we, you know, we were doing good stuff, but, and then I wanted to do more with, with the Mechanoids. I had a bigger story in mind. So the Mechanoids was a trilogy. So the second book mm -hmm. in the Mechanoids was the journey. And the third book was Homeworld. Yeah. And I did most of the art for them. I, I wrote them. Eric contributed a little bit here and there. You know, those were doing all right. Those came out in 81, 80, in 82. And they were starting to get some momentum. I'm getting to the point where I might be able to, uh, the print, uh, you know, the the Palladium Fantasy game the way I, I envision it. And then uh, Matt came up to me and said, I've got a cool idea. Let's do, let's try doing a box game. Because we found a place I could do it mm -hmm. simpler or cheaper. And uh, we came out with Valley, Valley of, of the Pharaoh. Pharaohs. Oh, my God. Is that in shrink wrap still? Yeah. Yeah. Oh <laughs> I've got like three copies that are still in. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! I have never been able to find one. Yeah, I, yeah. I used to. I used to have an opened one, but I think I sold it at a at a Palladium mm. open house. Oh so I can't god. show you the interior pages. I do have the little booklet that was inside. Again, you can see we're still sticking with the comic book size. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's, I mean, you have to understand. To us, this is like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> where you're just where they're wheeling it into the warehouse, and we're like. <gasps> <laughs> 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 well, and the problem with this was, and I came out in '82, and I put I put a ton of money in it. And, well, a ton of money at the time, probably mm -hmm. like six grand, six or seven grand, and it just tanked. And, and I learned two things from that, you know. And that's the thing is, you gotta understand, especially for all you guys out there who are watching this, all you people who want to be uh, a game publisher and start your own stuff. Follow your dreams; it's awesome. 
but it's a lot of work <laughs> and there are risks you know you need to learn as you go along mm -hmm. and so i learned from that that one historical games unless you do them just right and they have the right spin on them they don't sell yeah you know there's always exceptions like like bushido and aces and eights and some other stuff mm -hmm. out there for the most part historical games are not real popular second of all it didn't have enough wow factor it was kind of a more historically accurate mm -hmm. game and even though there's some really simple magic you know, compared to D and D or what we had in in Mechanoids, the, the the journey, and what what you know you could find in RuneQuest and other stuff, you know, who wanted to play this? You know, there was just not enough world development, not enough wow factor, magic, mm -hmm. and really you know monsters and shit you could fight and kick ass and have mm -hmm. fun. It was like eh, it's like a history lesson. Sorry, Matt, if you're watching this, because Matt. <laughs> even things i mean that's so true because even today like people are discussing on rpg conversation forums about man i sure would wish that i could find a wild west role-playing game that wasn't magical or wasn't horror or didn't have aliens mm -hmm. or i wish i could find a bronze age role-playing game that wasn't gods and mm -hmm. stuff so the people are out there but they are not the majority of their customers no yep. And and there's something strange, you know, with Valley of the Pharaohs. It like when I first found out this existed, it was became and still is, to be perfectly honest, one of my you know holy grails yeah. of uh, achieving. <laughs> but it, because I I as a kid was super interested in that particular period of history the you know of going from the early dynasties through the ptolemaic period but there is something about egypt where it's both incredibly fascinating to a lot of people and every single time somebody tries to do a role-playing setting based on egypt it tanks, tanks. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much magic you have in i mean yeah. like i have a copy sitting at home that's like a 290 page role-playing game supplement for th third edition dungeons and dragons that has like other than the rules nothing to do with dungeons and dragons it's not associated with forgotten realms or anything right. like that i've talked to the publisher of that game it is their worst selling product ever and it's it's like people if you like looked at the early days of the history channel and a and e you people would be eating up the documentaries can't get an egyptian selling uh, setting sold on as an mm -hmm. rpg and oh i don't know why the shame I, I i don't either because you're right the the gods are amazing and and you know we incorporated a ton oh, of yeah. them in palladium fantasy and people love them the gods are, are amazing um their abilities and powers and stuff are really cool i didn't know much about it until matt started to do um research for, for that book and i'm like holy crap man egyptian gods are are amazing this is really yeah. interesting stuff i fell in love with it i did a lot of the art, me and Mary Walsh, the same people who did the weapon series. Yeah, I had a blast with it. You know, one of the cool things that you can't see, unfortunately, is there are like a dozen um, 11 by 14 folded drawings that were really cool. Some of my best early work, I think, um, with cutaways of of um, the uh, pyramids and a bunch of mm -hmm. maps and other cool stuff that's that's really nice, and uh, it was a nice product, but, I mean, I, I, I admit it, it's not something that would be easy or super fun to play as it stands. Matt's been talking about maybe redoing it for a, a more modern audience and expanding it, so that's that's something that, that might happen, mm -hmm. whether we publish it or whether it's something I let him publish. Excuse Excuse me while I go steal a child so I can offer you my firstborn. <laughs> Make it happen. Make it happen. I, I want it. One day. One day it will be on my shelf. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's the thing is, you know, we learned everything through, through research and trial and error. Yeah, doing. It, it was pretty crazy. You know, we had some success. We had, you know, weapons and armor cooking and 
Weapons and Castles and the Three Mechanoid books and unfortunately Valley of the Pharaohs that sat in my attic for about 10 years. You know, that's the thing too, is we only printed like 5,000 copies of Valley of the Pharaohs. And I think we only ever sold about half of that. And the rest just got thrown out eventually. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, I kept like a half a dozen, which like I said, I've got three copies left, I think. And uh, all in pristine condition, but... Uh, we'll talk turkey after the episode, all right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny that that's, you know, everyone wants it now because it's so rare. But so, I, you know, we're getting there and I'm going a little bit slower than I would really like to do. Although if you think about it, I mean, we had produced in like two years, we had something mm-hmm. like eight products, which which ain't nothing. But, you know, my my holy grail was, you know, let's do this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I also, because again, I mean, not no slam, it was just sort of the industry norm. The art was so bad in most games. I wanted people to be able to pick up, pick up this book and flip through it and just see, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and detailed artwork. Okay. Great artwork. In fact, I'd like to ask a question about that, if I may. Yeah. Like flipping through the mechanoids, the, the early ones, you use a lot of the uh, like the the seventies and eighties dot art that was really really popular in some of the illustrated novels. Specifically, I'm thinking like um, like the old Keith Lommer, Retief, Death World kind of novels. If yeah. you're familiar with those, I don't know, but uh, somebody like uh, I think it's your Esper in there. It looks like just the 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 style and the feel of it just just comes from that era, and I love that era. And I was just wondering. Was that something you were interested in at the same time? Um, did you ever read those? Did those? Yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> like that could be Retief's sister, I mean, <laughs> the mercenary. <laughs> I was mostly a comic book. I mean, I read a lot of different stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that, that. By the way, those those dots are zipatone. You would actually cut them out, almost like color forms. Mm-hmm. When you cut it out of a sheet, trace it over your art peel it off and paste it back. I mean, it just had a sticky back. Yeah. Root it on, and it was crazy. Yeah, I think I, I think I read a little bit of that, and I was into, you know, heavy metal and all kinds of shit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if it was a comic book, I probably read it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, because that was my thing. I mean, and that's, that's the other funny thing, and I've, I've said this before, but Palladium Books was supposed to be just temporary, until I broke into comic books. Ah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the next thing I know, you know, I've got this burgeoning company that's mm-hmm. about to take off like crazy. And uh, I'm like, oh, well, maybe, you know, at some point I'll, I'll also do comic books. And then, you know, that, that kind of never happened. And, you know, I wake up one day and I'm like, oh, I got a $2 million company. I love what I do. I love world building. Maybe I'll just mm-hmm. hire a bunch of comic book guys. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which I did, which is, you know, mm-hmm. like the guys like uh, Freddie Williams and Ramon Perez and Jim Stewart, yeah. Richard Corbin and Stephen Bissett, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and others. You you worked with, with Corbin? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <gasps> Yeah, he was, which he was, which book is that? I don't seem to that have was, that no, one yet. He did the cover <laughs> to the original Beyond the Supernatural. Oh, oh that's, oh, that's oh. right. Oh. Which is still one of my favorite covers it, you that mm, you ever put out. The like, art, the art in Beyond the Supernatural first edition was some of the best I've ever seen in the gaming industry. So yeah, it it really <sighs> sold the entire concept. And, and talk about a cover piece that <laughs> nails the content. Yeah. Just saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, Corbin was really good. It was funny because for people who are not, I'm personally surprised at how many people aren't familiar with Richard Corbin. I'm glad you guys know him. Um, he rose to fame doing um, underground comics. And yeah. it's sort of his famous thing. So what people do now is uh, heavy metal, the, the animated movie. Mm-hmm. And, and a, a lot of that, especially the, the one long sequence, that's all based on on Corbin or inspired mm-hmm. by Richard Corbin's work, and uh, so he was famous for doing women with quite literally watermelon boobs mm-hmm. and, and men who had penises that were you know like jackhammers and you know 
18 inches long and <laughs> menly oh. men, womenly women, and horrifying monsters. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he did the greatest horrifying monsters. Mm-hmm. So I, I loved his work. And he did a, so one of the amazing things that people don't know about Corbin, a lot of his, his early work that appeared in Heavy Metal Magazine uh, and elsewhere, he actually did the color separations himself. Really? Mm-hmm. He airbrushed each. So this is your red, this is your yellow, this is on separate layers of acetate. Unbelievable. Talk about a guy who had technical proficiency and an wow. eye for color where he could mm-hmm. do all of that in, in gray. I mean, he's, he's yeah. a painting in, in gray and, you know, grayscale to come out with these amazing colors. Uh, the guy was phenomenal. So I was very honored to, to, to work with him on that. Although I, I was worried. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Rich and I'm like, you know, Richard, I, I love your art. You know, you're fantastic, but uh, I'm sorry, but, I'm going for like PG <laughs> thirteen, and, uh, and let me be really clear on what PG thirteen is because this is the eighties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we can't have watermelon breast, and uh, you know we need to have them. And in, in you guys are all familiar. Let me get out of here someplace, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, wow. Classic cover. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and, you know, I needed a woman that had, you know, good proportions, natural mm-hmm. proportions, and he, he did it. He was not offended at all. He's a really nice guy. It was funny. I don't know if it was the age difference or, or, or what, but, you know, I had nice conversations with Richard, and, and he was a sweetheart. I, my company's just started taking off. This is, what, 80, 88? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're really starting to take off. Well, I don't have a ton of money. And I said, Richard, I, I adore that cover. Mm-hmm. I would love to buy it. You know, what What are you selling them for? And he goes, well, I'm getting like, at the time, like $5,000 a cover. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. I absolutely believe I that, can't, yeah. I can't afford that. And he's like, well, what can you afford? And I said, I, I said, no, that's okay. I said, I was hoping it'd be more like, you know, 1200 And he's like, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. You you clearly love it so much. I want you to have it. And I'm like, great. And he's like, talk to my agent. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I talk to the agent, and he's like, that'll be, you know, $5,000. And I'm like, I, I, I talked to Richard, and he said I could have her 12. 12? <laughs> there's, no way. <laughs> there's no way you can have it for 12. Maybe three. Let me talk to Rich. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so you know, I'm just you know, I'm, I'm like I don't know, thirty, thirty two at the time, mm-hmm. and I'm like, "Hey, Rich, thanks." You know, your agent said he can't take less than three thousand, and Richard, like, he did, did he? <laughs> <laughs> if oh, you're man. at the twelve hundred, write the check, mail it to this address. <laughs> I'll take care of my agent. <laughs> oh my god. So, cool is that? that that's, that's amazing because for folks who don't know i mean at this point corbin's already got heavy metal up and running uh he's already mm-hmm. done the cover for meatloaf back out of hell uh, yeah. you know and it's like this is amazing you know <laughs> his art books are like bestsellers a den has happened yeah yeah he, he's one of the hottest guys mm-hmm. at, at that time he's one of the hottest guys in comics and, and you know he's quickly becoming a legend and uh, so that was amazing. So get this. The story doesn't end there. Oh, oh. All right. So I get the painting. I'm like thrilled. I mean, it's hanging in our, in our office right now in our hall. I love that thing. And uh, in the mail, I get something like a small package from Richard. And I open it up and it's the two watercolor roughs. Oh. And I call up Richard and I'm like, Richard, I, I got these two watercolor roughs, but, you know, I, I could barely afford the painting. I can't afford these two. And he's like, no, no, you love it so much. I want you to have it. I thought you'd enjoy it. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> and this is how Palladium nearly didn't become a thing because you had a heart attack at the age of 32. <laughs> yep. 
Wow. He was just a sweet guy. He was a very nice guy. But what I'm starting to say is it's funny because Steve Bissett, who was hot as hell at the time, he was uh, the new artist on Swamp Thing, and people were going mm-hmm. crazy. And Steve oh, Bissett yeah. did most of the our original art in that first edition. He's like, oh, man, Richard Corbin. I'd love to talk to Richard Corbin. Kev, can, can you hook me up? And I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll let Richard know, and uh, I'll pass along your phone number, and, you know, I, I don't know if he'll call you or not. And he's like, that, that'd be great, Kev. And so I'm like, okay. So I, I pass it along, and I talked to Steve Bissett a few, a few weeks later. He's like, oh, that Richard Corbin, he cracks me up. Doesn't he crack you up? <laughs> and I'm thinking, no, our, our conversations are really just business. <laughs> and, you know, there wasn't a lot of, like I said, I don't know if it was the age difference or mm. or what, but we, you know, I usually hit it off with people, but I didn't really hit it off with I mean, he was sweetheart, obviously, mm. and we had conversations, but it wasn't like, man, it was so much fun talking to Richard, and man, what a card. He was just yeah. like, very serious. That's crazy, though. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> wow. You've you've been so in these early days. You seem to have a gift for networking. You you might not always get the yes, but you always seem to leave people with a good impression. Mm-hmm. How much? How much of that was your uh, key to your success? You think? Why? Well, I, I think I think networking is is hugely important. Uh, it's funny you said that because. I wasn't very good at it, especially in, in the early days. I mean, obviously good enough. And I think I think I felt comfortable with fellow artists and and, and especially comic book guys because mm-hmm. we kind of spoke the same language and I, I would be fans of their stuff. And I would, you can tell when you're talking to someone if they really know your stuff or whether, I mean, this is a great example. I mean, you guys clearly are immersed in Palladium stuff. You, you know <laughs> our books. And, and and our our characters and, and the lore and all that stuff, our history, mm-hmm. would have a genuine interest versus someone who says, "Hey, I hear you doing Ninja Turtles, and that's topical. So let's do mm-hmm. you know, yeah. have our our interview on that." And which is awesome. We appreciate everyone who did that for us. But it, it's it's different, and I and I think I connected with a lot of guys, and because I love art, it shows. And I think also because, as 99% of artists will tell you, when they first start out, they get screwed. Mm-hmm. Publishers take advantage of them, and, and they get screwed. That happened to me, of course. And I vowed if I was ever in a position where I could hire artists, I would not take advantage of them. I would not uh, screw them. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that has served me really, really well. And it has shocks me how many it has changed some degree nowadays where artists are treated a bit more fairly and more equally. But I used to say that artists don't realize it, but when they go up to a publisher, there's this for them it's this big invisible neon sign that they can't see, the artist. But the publisher sees this big neon sign with an arrow pointing down and says, Artist, please fuck me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Because they did or would try. And I'm like, I'm, ne- I'm never going to do that. So we offered like some of the best rates. Uh, you know, one of the things I took as a huge compliment from Steve Bissett is uh, like, like, like three, four years after Beyond the Supernatural had come out, he said, Kevin, I want to I wanna compliment you on you're like the only publisher that has continued to send me royalties. Mm-hmm. Even if they're small, you know, even if it's like a $15 check, I'm still getting that $15 check um, or $200 check. And I'm like, well, but that's the the deal. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, but most people don't live up to that. No. And that goes a long way, you know, it it just, it just does. And and people talk uh, like even now when I, when I talk to new artists who aren't necessarily familiar first off, like at Gen Con and other places, and they come to my booth and they're like looking at our, our books and they're like, holy shit, you, you work with Richard Corbin? I'm like, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Stranko cover? Uh-huh. Are these Dave Dorman covers? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Keith Parkinson? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Hey, um. uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they're like, you know, Ian Gist? Uh-huh. And how, many, like, uh, how many Brom covers did you get? 
Unfortunately, I was stupid. <laughs> I, I, I love Blum. He loves So do me. we. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and hopefully he won't be offended by this, but one of the things, so first of all, Gerald Brum is like one of the nicest, sweetest people on the planet. <laughs> he is just a great guy. And I cannot say enough of him about him. And uh, I only got two Brom covers, plus uh, I think we got second publishing rights for two covers on uh, on uh, something that had already been published someplace for two issues of The Rifter. So like four mm-hmm. covers, I think, we published with Brom. Why they're not 44, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was just a sweet guy. I could afford him. So actually, I guess we did like five covers because Nightbane, um, Yin Sloth Jungle, yeah. and um, 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 South, uh, South Winds, or not South Winds, uh, South America. Wasn't he the Western Empire too? Oh, Western Empire. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Western Empire. Yeah. So that that's six covers plus a couple of rifters. So yeah. <laughs> Matthew is sitting there stroking the cover. <laughs> the paintings when, hanging in my office, the original painting. Uh, when NPC and I uh, were first getting going, whenever we did a, a, a Brahm cover, we'd do it with the Inception noise. We go Brahm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Yep. Now Brahm is. Brum is the best, man. And uh, what I used to find funny is in, in his youth, I swear to God, he looked like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm holding the best cover ever, but I mean, it's uh-huh. just like... <laughs> I'll put these back away. <laughs> so, but, but it's interesting uh, about you know, the early days in sort of being a trailblazer. Mm-hmm. So nowadays, everyone's like, yeah, of course, perfect bound books. Mm-mm. You see them everywhere in, in every, you know, every genre, especially in, in, in role playing. But when we did this, nobody else was doing it. Mm-hmm. I think the only other company that came out with a, a perfect bound soft cover edition was uh, RuneQuest at one point. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Nobody did it forever. Fasa, I think, started to do it with Mech Warrior. Yeah, yeah. A few years later. Yeah, and they. I, I will say this: they hold up. Mm-hmm. I, I, I. There's, there's the plastic peel, but they. I still have them. You know, and they're they're still good to varying degrees. All of the Palladium books that I have have held up, except for some of the early ones that had the plastic peel. But the Fasa books. I don't want to put anybody down specifically, but those FASA books they didn't fell make it apart. Like mm-hmm. all of my early Battletech and Shadowrun and and uh, Star Trek Perfect mm-hmm. Bounds, the pages just started falling out very quickly. Wherever you got it from was just better. <laughs> but the thing is, yeah. I, I love, as you can tell from my office, I love books. Mm-hmm. Not not just role playing books. I love books, and I've always been interested in print and quality. And so in the early days of role-playing, books falling apart, pages falling out were really common. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I didn't want that. And so we, we became known as, as the company that the pages would never fall out of because we, we and I never understood this. It's like, put your money in the product. Mm-hmm. So for like an extra, I don't know what it was, like 15 cents or 20 cents a book. Yeah, that's cutting into your margin times five or ten or twenty thousand. But I mean, God sakes, that's nothing. Yeah, we would spend the money to get our books smith sewn and glued. Mm-hmm. So, just like most hardcovers, these books are sewn. The pages will not fall out. You'd have to tear them out or cut them out. They cannot fall out because they're they're sewn yeah. together. So fun little story going off of this, uh, about a decade ago, I was over at a person's house, didn't know that they were a role player. And, uh, I walked into their study and saw their shelf of role-playing books. It included a first edition, first printing of ninjas and super spies. That 
I don't know if it was his particular copy, but I've seen other copies of that one where um, it had the uh, split issue um, in it. And in the front cover of that one, because he pulled it off the shelf to show it to me, there was a letter from when he had reported the uh, that it had split within two months of his purchase from you all. Uh, it was signed by, like, I guess your office manager at the time or whatever, apologizing profusely. <laughs> it was hysterical. He kept it with the addition as, like, a, a, just a sign of, you know, how much you, you folks endorsed your product. And well, we do, and quality. we care about our fans, yeah. you know? So, you know, but so so... Doing Perfect Bound was new. Now, the original book or two, the first few books, mm -hmm. they were uh, varnish, not plastic lamb. And mm -hmm. while the lamb, especially the early lamb, will eventually peel off mm -hmm. uh, with, with you know, profound use and age, I felt like they held up better. That's why we went always go with the plastic lamb. But it's funny, other things we had to sell is at the time in 1983 when this came out there was the perception that these are much more flimsy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. must be shrink wrapped to protect them mm -mm. oh my gosh i had to fight with my distributors to not shrink wrap my books mm -hmm. because i wanted people to be able to flip through and see the cool artwork and go holy shit what's that mm -hmm. yeah that dragon's cool. Oh, who? Wow, what's this? You know, I mean, you're not going to find that in a D and D book in 1983. <laughs> no, you're not. You know? I mean, the biggest distributor at the time, Windmill Hobbies, Joe Butcher Budrick. He's he's a, I, I I loved loved Joe, a really good guy. He was sort of your typical cranky old man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he was a holdout. He didn't buy our stuff for the longest time. Oh, that's not true, because he bought it in 1983. But, you know, we kept sending him product. Every new release, we never hear a word. Mm -hmm. And so finally one day, I get a call from from Joe Budrick at Woodmill Hobby, and he's like, you know, yeah, I want to buy, you know, 50 of these and 30 of those and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I was so excited to have him. Because that's the thing, too, you got to realize in the early days, I mean, I was pretty much Palladium Books mm -hmm. with some help from Alex. And then my, my fiance, Marianne Dietrich, and then, uh, you know, and some other friends, Woodjick, and this person, that person would, would chip in. We were kind of talking, Alex and I were talking about that before the show. And he's like, who is that woman that you were so impressed with that, that, you know, could really, you know, do key lining super fast? And I'm like, I don't know who you're talking about, Al. And he's like, you know, it was some woman, you know, and he's like, from CCS, maybe, Center for Creative Studies. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Lori Mazur. But, you know, people would, would come in and give me a hand, especially Alex and, and Matthew Ballant and Eric Wojcik. But it was pretty much a one-man show. And then I think Alex was my first part-time employee. You know, I, Alex has been my, Alex Marcinison has been my best friend since eighth grade. Anyways, Joe calls up and he's like, you know, and I'm like, Joe, I'm so glad you're picking it. I, I, I think I think you'll be really happy with this. Your competitors are, are, are buying this like crazy. And he's like, no shit, kid. What do you think I'm buying this for? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh yeah. Uh. But but he was a he was a cool guy because when he saw Plenty of Fantasy, he believed in it so much. That, you know, the whole hobby industry, no matter how nice it looks, mm -hmm. you know, it has always been direct sale, which means mm -hmm. if your store buys it and they don't sell tough cookies, you know, you, 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 you eat that loss. Yep. Joe actually went around to like a hundred of his top clients and said, you take five copies of this book. And if you haven't sold them in two months, I'll take them back. That's actually amazing for early model booksellers. That's that's wild. It was. Yeah, what a great guy. Um, good guy. Yeah. But <laughs> at the fight with Joe, because he would shrink wrap the fucking books. <laughs> <laughs> like, Joe, no, I want to work like this and get a hard on. <laughs> 
hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> my original brick and mortar gaming store was collector's connection up in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, which I'm probably going to end up mentioning because uh, they had a lot of positive things over the almost two decades I did business with them. And uh, one of the things they absolutely hated about Palladium Books is they'd come in shrink-wrapped and then they'd have to have somebody sitting there for hours unshrink-wrapping them <laughs> before they went on the shelves because they knew that people wanted to open them and see the product. Mm. That wasn't us! That was <laughs> yeah. I had to fight with them like crazy. It, it took, I don't think Joe stopped until like 88 or 89. I'm like, Joe, don't make me come over there. You're just in Ohio or just in Illinois. I, I can drive down. That was another reason why, uh, as you were saying earlier, the whole box set thing. For me, it was always another strike against getting a box set was that I couldn't look at the components. And yeah. I understand why they did it. They didn't want anybody to just opening it up and taking the dice or whatever. But when you have a box set that actually has books in it, I want to see inside the books. I'm not buying it for yep. the box. I'm buying it yep. for the books. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that gets back to what you were saying, where it grew out of the war game, which is all boxes. And so a lot of people had the mentality of, if it's a game, it's got to be in a box. Mm. Which I understand to a degree, you're seeing that more and more these days. And we're talking about doing... Uh, in the future that palladium will do uh, introductory box sets because for grandma and grandpa and uncle bob mm -hmm. they, they see a big ass book and they're like holy shit <laughs> this is a rule book yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's 250 freaking pages i'm not buying this for 12 year old timmy mm-hmm the lost leader these days everyone's doing it battle tech has a has a tiny box and you know Warhammer has a tiny box and D and D has a tiny box and Yep. Yeah. But, but that's because when Uncle Bob goes and sees a box mm -hmm. and he can flip it over and he goes, Oh, you get these two booklets on how to play. One's an adventure book, one's the rules. Yeah. You get some dice, you get some uh, character cards, some character sheets, a map that all makes sense to them because it's what they know as a board game. It's an old model. The first taste is cheap. After that, you pay. <laughs> but, you know, in the early days, we couldn't afford all that. And I sat back and went, I'm a role-playing game company. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I do role-playing games. I don't want to uh, uh, be putting all this other stuff in there. I, I, I'm going to create a really nice, durable book and, and sell it as a book. You know, I want people to be able to you know, to flip through it and go, oh, yeah, oh, wow, this is cool, you know, which you can't do with a box, no matter how well the box is designed to show what's in it, you know, you can't see it. You know, that was the Kevin Long cover we did later. Yeah. I wish I kept that on there a lot longer than I did. It's a great, I love that cover. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I admit I'm partial to the red and black. That was my first taste of holding an RPG book in my yes. hands. And that red and black, just just looking at that, I remember my imagination just going a million miles an hour from that one image. Yeah. Well, and again, the mother of necessity. I mm. couldn't I couldn't afford to do a color cover, but I could do a two color cover. And you know, I did my homework. You know, I'm being an artist. I already kind of knew this, but you know, red and black—that's a real popular color combination. Yeah, mm -hmm. but red, black, and white. And uh, so I'm like, I'm going to do this. They have a cool back cover, and I will have a cool game master screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that's why Arms of Nargash Tor, our first source book. Oh, you know, with that cover, it's two colors too because I couldn't afford to do color and you know the art was mine because i couldn't really afford to hire artists but it's good art so <laughs> thanks no loss there yeah <laughs> yeah well and the judges cocktail. guild helped me you know i didn't realize it so one of the things judges guild did is they they would reprint my art well, a lot of people's art uh over and over and over and over and over and over again and uh 
Uh, in fact, one particular piece, it happens to be a spider, a uh, very nicely rendered spider. It was a full page illustration. They ended up, to my knowledge, they reprinted it 26 times. So even though I only worked for Judges Guild for like six months, people saw my art for like six years. And, and, and me and um, Janelle Jacoy were, were known as the, uh, the two good artists at Judges Guild. I mean, they had some other good artists, but I mean, we tended to be a cut above the rest. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, that was, that was pretty, pretty cool. So people knew my art. So when they'd see my art, they're like, oh, it's that good artist from. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, th- that, I think that helped me. The art definitely, definitely, like your your commitment to paying the artist shows in the fact that you have good art. And I think any anybody that I've met over the last mm. years of my life talking about role-playing games when would inevitably come to the conversation of our love of Palladium games, they're like, that art! Mm-hmm. Like it always yeah. goes there within the first, like, 15 seconds of that part of the conversation. Always. Yeah. It's, and for me, it's one of two. It's either the, uh, we call it the butts edition, the, the, the first rifter, uh, the first rift. I don't know if you know that about us, but, and the second one is, uh, the, the Robotech. Oh yeah. Uh, the, this, this book is, are, was the one that, that hooked me such an amazing book, such amazing art too. Well, Kevin Long, you don't get much better than Kevin Long. I mean, the guy's, the guy's great. Uh, and does magnificent robots mm. and machines and. I mean, he's a great all-around artist, but I mean, his his uh, robots are just stellar. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, you know, I, I know art, and, and, and I know good art, and uh, like I said, I've always been able to relate to artists. So very quickly, early on, I, I came to realize I can find lots of artists who are as good or better than I am, but it's hard to find people who really get role-playing and world-building the way I envision it, the way Woodjick envisions it, the way now Sean Robertson envisions it. So I, I started to do less and less art and more and more of the writing. Which again, for like the first 15 years, if someone said, well, what do you do for, for a living? And I'd be like, I'm an artist. Oh, yeah, and I write. And I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> writer, publisher who does some art. Yeah. But, you know, that was my orientation. I wanted to be an artist for the longest time and was. I am. Yeah. But, uh, you know, where I really made my mark is in world building and, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's been a blast. But NBC, we, we, were, we were talking about uh, moments that, that could have changed the course of, of history for, for, for me and Palladium. Mm-hmm. Did you want to get into this in, in that with? Yeah. Yeah. Janine or Janelle. Um, so Jacoys and I, we, we, we hit it off. Uh, like I said, you, you can't tell nowadays because I'm a blabbermouth, but um, I used to be very shy. Uh, so I was not a great schmoozer, especially at like parties and things. Mm-hmm. But, you know, one on one and with artists, you know. And so Janelle and I hit it off. And, and we were Judges Guild's two top artists. So Janelle went on to do work for other game companies and and most notably went on to become like the uh, art director and and I think games manager or games, I forget her I forget her title. But she was like the head of games at Kamiko or Kamiko at um Calico. Calico. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kamiko was a comic book company. Kamiko Calico was Cabot Patch and mm-hmm. ColecoVision, which most people don't remember these days, but they were like cutting edge in the video game business. I mean, they really were. And, and, and I met, uh, well, I got a call, so she'll, she calls me and says, Kev, I want you to be my art director. Oh, wow. And, and yeah, at, at, at Coleco. And uh, this is like 1984. Mm-hmm. She's like, look, Thirty-five thousand dollars to start. Great health care benefits, and this was big money in nineteen eighty-three. In eighty-four, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plus a ten thousand dollar moving budget, which you get whether you spend ten thousand dollars or not. 
holy because I would have had moved up to wherever they were located. I think it was Connecticut, and I, I really thought long and hard about that because I mean, you know, yeah. I had a family. I had just gotten married, and and you know, my my wife had uh, you know a four and six year old, and I'm like, wow, this could be something you know big. And I liked working with Janelle. I thought that'd be great. I'm like, holy moly, maybe I should, maybe I should do this. And then uh, my mom was sick. I think that was the big thing that stopped me, really, was that uh, she was sick and I'd have to move away. And mm. I didn't, I didn't really want to do it. My mom and dad needed my help. You know, wanted to be there. I mean, when I say sick, I mean like on, on death's door. I mean, she lived till eighty nine, but she had her good, good years and bad years, and so. Uh, I turn, I turn Janelle down, and then I'm at, I'm at Gen Con, and she shows up in front of my booth, and she's like, "Kevin, you got to do this." <laughs> it was kind of like Darth Vader. It was kind of like, "Just think what you and I can do together." <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I remember feeling so awkward because I'm like, "But Janelle." And leave all of this, and I sweep. <laughs> and you know, it's like the three mechanoid books, three weapon books, mm. Heroes Unlimited just come out. So it was Palladium Fantasy, Nargash Tor. You know, Heroes Unlimited was brand new, and and she just kind of smiles and says, "Think about it, talk about it with your wife." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a low blow right there. <laughs> Somebody was playing hardball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But man, I mean, if I had, if I had taken that job, would, would I have shut Palladium down? Would I have continued to do this? Would I have gotten Turtles a year later? Right. Or Robotech two years after that? I mean, none of that stuff might have ever happened. There might never have been Rifts or or Mm -hmm. Supernatural or any of that stuff. Yeah. On behalf of us all, we're, I'm glad to say that you didn't become a salary man for Coleco Vision <laughs> continued to chart your own course. Didn't Coleco kind of tank shortly after that? Anyway, they did. Yeah. It was one of those things that you know, one of those rare moments where two years later, in a company that was like sky high, is on um, yeah. kids, and I'm like, I guess that was a really smart decision. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, they were one of the trailing casualties of the Great Arcade Crash. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's weird that you even you have a Coleco connection uh, in that way, because so many other people that were involved with Coleco, uh, Michael Stackpole, a couple others passed through Coleco at some point in their career and went on to be amazing world builders within the RPG related space. Yeah. Well, I think part of that was Janelle recognized that. Mm -hmm. She, She was very sharp. And knew it made good games and was really trying to put together one of the first big, you know, studio bullpens of artists, writers, creators. Yeah, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think she kind of knew what she was doing and uh, they had faith in her and were letting her run with things. It's a shame they went they went under. I mean, that's sort of the problem when you, you kind of live and die by uh, fads. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, they had the double whammy of Cabbage Patch Kids was huge. And right around the same time Cabbage Patch Kids were, were tanking, so was ColecoVision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was it. It was all over. Well, and then at some point, uh, Jim Steranko, you know, so again, my comic book, Jim Steranko was like a god to me, and I kind of jumping ahead, but Steranko offered me a job mm. as well. And, and I, mm. that was an easier one to turn down. You know, that that was kind of wild. What if I had taken that job and did be work for Jim Steranko in Reading, Pennsylvania? So when did you start kind of like you and, and Eric Wujek did a lot of work together in the very, very early days. When did you start kind of putting together like a, a team of the of the names we'd start to recognize as time as time goes on? A lot of the, the usual suspects. Yeah, I think pretty, pretty quickly. Mm hmm. You know, Eric and I actually had a little bit of a falling out because, you know, the gaming center was really his baby. Mm. Um, there was a board of directors of like eight of us 
but it was Eric's. It was Eric's baby. He kept it alive in some capacity or another for like the next twenty years. But mm-hmm. in uh, in eighty three, you know, I had been with it from the beginning, and uh, you know, my company was starting to take off with Palladium Fantasy coming out in eighty three. And I said, Eric, this is going to be my last year at the gaming center. I'm going to step down from the board of directors. And his his best friend Renee Vega had just done the same thing. Mm. earlier and i think he kind of felt like we were all abandoning him and uh i think there were i don't know we we were we weren't really estranged for very long obviously oh, no. yeah you know, like maybe a year where we didn't talk very much and i think his feelings are really hurt but i mean you know what two years later he's writing teenage Mutant ninja turtles <laughs> right <laughs> yeah you know and we were just so so close I've actually, I met you, Kevin, I met you and Eric years ago, uh, very briefly at Dragon Con. Oh, yeah. 2001. Yeah. I, I believe it was 2001. Or that either. sounds right. Because, so, I had just, at that con, released, quote unquote, released the first game that I had ever written, which was a live action role point game. And we had a booth in the gaming area that... A bunch of the friends that I had met, we would, we would all meet down at the booth before we went out and for the, our evening of partying. And you and Eric were leaning against that table one day when I came down to wait for some friends. I was like, that's, is that, is that Kevin? <laughs> 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 and you handed me a, you gave me a book at, I think it was either one of the Coalition Wars books or some, anyway, I was just like, huh, cool. All right. Bye. <laughs> yep. Small world. Small world. Yeah. Yeah. I I wish I hadn't. Uh, I wish I hadn't stopped doing Dragon Con. I. Uh, they 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 loved me and said that I was welcome to come every single year, and I wish I had because it's a great con and I haven't been there in a long time now and I'm sure the current organizers don't know me from Adam but. It was great. I mean, that year, was that the year that Harlan Ellison w- was a guest? That was either that year or the year after. Yeah. Because I remember being there with Harlan Ellison. That was a trip. I, I oh, always yeah. Loved yeah. I was the last person in the line to get to meet him for the, his signature booth. In fact, they had already closed the line, and I had <laughs> snuck into it at the last spot. And when I get up there, the person standing there is like, you're not supposed to be here. And Harlan looks at me like, like, like he is just frustrated as all hell. And I say, and the, because the person who was right in front of me had brought like 30 books. Oh, and Lord. And he was signing them, and he looked at me. It's like, I said, I just want to shake your hand, man. And he said, thank you. <laughs> and that was our interaction. Yep. Yeah, he was my favorite writer for a very long time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He's super prolific mm-hmm. and uh, consistently good. Yep. I actually have a Harlan Ellison story, although it kind of ties more to Ninja Turtles. Of course, I got really Ninja Turtles stories. We'll, we'll note it down for when we get to Turtles. Yeah, but, you should. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, should, Harlan yeah. Ellison Turtles. <laughs> yeah, that's one I gotta hear. Yeah, it's one I desperately <laughs> want to hear, but we'll definitely do it. So, anything else that you think would be like worth sharing of that lead up to? Between, yeah, what, what what do you think? Yeah, that when you finally hit go on Palladium Fantasy, like what all? Hell, I mean, what was that like? What did that feel like? Like finally, just being like, bam! I have this book now buy it. <laughs> oh, it, it it feels great it's it's like it's like having a baby you know seriously mm-hmm. it's it's your baby and you're holding it and it's funny because uh i've been able to enjoy this again with, with sean uh my business partner when when titan robotics and, and, and cyberworks came out he's like oh yeah <laughs> and, and, and the people listening to this might think it sounds crazy, but it's like, Mm-mm. even though you wrote the whole thing and, and and maybe even laid it out and you sent it to them, I mean, you're there shepherding it every step of the way until it's delivered in your hands. It's not real. And there's just something that feels so good 
to yeah. hold your baby mm-hmm. in your arms and go, oh yeah, there there he is or there she is, mm-hmm. and she's beautiful. <laughs> uh, it's just it's very rewarding. Yeah, I mean, it just is. And back then it was awesome. I mean, we were we we're off to the races, and it just it felt great. Uh, and, and I got to I want to give a shout out to Tom Bartold because um, he helped change the fate of Palladium. So, like I said, we were doing pretty good. We kind of got a, a little stumble with uh, a Valley of the Pharaohs. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have the money now to to do Palladium Fantasy. I would have to wait probably another six months or a year. And uh, Tom Bartold, who was one of my original defilers in, the, in my fantasy game, one of the guys that encouraged me to, to go off on my own in the first place, calls me up out of the blue. At some evening, I get a call from him, and he goes, yeah, Kev. And Tom was kind of a goofy guy like this. And he's like, so I've got $10,000, and I need you to tell me why I should invest it in Palladium Books instead of buying land in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, what? Yeah, here's why. I just into my my pitch mode and ranted and raved for 15 minutes. And Tom said, "Okay, I'll give you the check this weekend at the game." And I'm like, "Hot damn!" I work up a contract, and you know, we we worked up a, a deal and. Because of Tom, I was able to do that Palladium Fantasy. And Palladium Fantasy and, and those weapon books really helped helped us get moving. Mm. And, and, you know, it's funny because I am a comic book guy and everyone who knew me knew I was very much a comic book superhero guy. In those early years, all I got over and over again is, you're doing what? Palladium mm. Fantasy? The Mechanoids? Shouldn't you be doing a superhero book? All these other people are doing superhero books. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it's just not there. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, it's it's still percolating in my head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What it needs to be, it isn't it isn't done yet. It's it's not it's not ready. And uh they're like, okay. But it's when when Heroes Unlimited came out, there were already like, I don't know, 15, 20 different superhero games out. There were a bunch of fantasy games when I came out with my fantasy book too. So, one of the interesting things is uh, of that period with all the publishing companies that were taking off in the RPG space is how many of them didn't survive their Valley of the Pharaohs mm-hmm. moment, and yeah. also like, and this goes even to this day, how important those angel investors are, the, those people who believe in the team behind the product and the product themselves and will write a ten thousand dollar check to yeah. bridge the gap and yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know I, I i so like i super appreciate it whenever you know folks like you remember those people who cut that five thousand ten thousand mm-hmm. dollar check at during the break make or break moment just to keep the lights on and keep things rolling yeah well, even the even the fifteen hundred dollar people, yeah, uh, Francis Loeb's William Messner Loeb's mom, she oh. knew. I mean, we were pretty close. She was a sweet lady, and uh, I wanted to launch my company. And and like I said, I was a poor kid in Detroit, so I didn't have a pot to piss in. I had fifteen hundred dollars. I needed three thousand to print this, and uh, I said, Mrs. Loeb's. You know, could you lend me fifteen hundred dollars? I mean, again, we worked out a deal. She got ten percent of the profit, and uh, and uh, she was a sweetheart. And she said, "Yes, I'll I'll do that for you, Kevin." And she lent me the money, and so you know, fifteen three thousand dollars, half of that borrowed in a dream, launched my company. And that's why I say, follow your dreams, people, mm-hmm. and just realize it, it's going to be work. Nothing's easy, so- and if you're willing to put in the work if you love it do it because it's it's awesome to live your dreams Mm -hmm. so she got so she so she did that for a repayment of a fifteen hundred dollar loan and uh 10 points on the publishing apparently she and my grandmother were cut from the same cloth (laughs) (laughs) yeah no follow your dream and and you know don't be afraid to ask and get the no yeah 
Well, that was the other thing. You, you, I, one of you guys had asked something about how did you, you know, find all these these artists, and, and yeah. that was a thing. Alex was great. Where he was, uh, he's always been sort of my my researcher, bloodhound guy. And and even though I was, I was shy, uh, especially in like social situations, I I was pretty straightforward and bold in other areas and. So like a lot of people when we got Jim Storenko, we're like, How did hell did you get Jim Storenko? You know, we we I called them up and said, Hi Jim, <laughs> this is what I do. I want you to do a cover. Well, how much do you charge? He told me, and I said, Ooh, I'll have to see if I can dig that up. I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it was as simple as mm-hmm. as that. Um, you know, it never hurts to ask. I mean, sure, they might say no. Don't take it personally, mm-hmm. you know, and, and explore the possibilities always. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't hurt that, you know, you, you were talking about how many uh, superhero games there were and uh, how many like D&D, you know, fantasy games there were. But I don't think there was one uh, NPC. What do you say about Palladium Fantasy <laughs> that is it ma- that makes it different, especially when you're talking about the. Uh, the, the cauldron, oh, what do you call that? I refer to it, I say, Palladium Fantasy is metal as fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do wizards gain spells in Palladium Fantasy? By drinking pints of blood and casting a spell yeah. that can drive them crazy. <laughs> That's how you get spells. I'm like, okay, yeah, this game's pretty metal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that I like awesome. it. That yeah. is also the most Detroit sentiment I can yeah. think of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, there, there is, you know, something to be said for, you know, never taking no for an answer and keep going. But it, it's plain to see that you have a unique vision in the realm of, because we're 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 all building off of D and D, right? And at a certain level, that that was that was the precursor. That is the ur of it all. But your unique vision is so much different than everything else out there, and you can see it as far back as the bloody mechanoids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I mean, not to underplay it, but I mean, what what you have and what you still have is amazing. And thank you for not taking a Coleco job, <laughs> because. <laughs> It's just, it's awesome. We love it. We've, how many episodes are we? Have we hit 150? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we have, we haven't we? We did a while ago. 54 or something like oh, that. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've been talking about your stuff for a while. <laughs> <You know? That's> <laughs> yeah. I do have one question about the early days that yeah. uh, I've wondered about for quite a while. How did the Defilers get their name? Well, they uh, they kind of earned that name. Um, because they, they just, uh, uh, man, Julius had a whole long thing about defiler of gods, destroyer of something. And, uh, he had a great line about it. It was like a little poem. So in, in the early days when I was running my, my fantasy game for three and a half years, which turned out to be basically my, my three and a half year play test, but for the rules. Mm-hmm. They ran across all kinds of crazy shit. You know, I had a Palladium. I didn't even realize that until, again, Tom Bartold in like 1995 said, you know, Kev, I've been thinking about our game. And he goes, you know, everything that's in Rifts was in that original Palladium Defiler campaign. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Because we had Dr. Articulus who combined a twin the twin magics of science or of magic and technology. We had a, a vampire level. Um, we had uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. They, they traveled to other worlds, the plenty of mm-hmm. desire itself. And again, I think this is going to be a different episode, but yeah. it, it was a dimensional portal basically. And they, they experienced time loops and everything. And so really a lot of that stuff that you see running through, all my games right through rifts sort of had their seeds planted in in those early days. And, uh, you know, it helped to have, you know, great input and ideas from guys like Alex and, and, and Eric Woodjick in particular, you know, Eric, you know, helped me hammer out my alignment system and, and the, the attribute system, you know, he would, uh, 
he would call me up and say, hey, Kev, I got to go do my laundry. And he would pick a laundromat that happened to be in my part of town. And so we'd meet at the laundry or he'd pick me up at the house because I probably didn't have a car. <laughs> and I uh, would go in the laundry and people must have thought we were crazy because we'd be getting all excited about, you know, demons and monsters and knights. And that. <laughs> you were telling, yes, yeah, so I aberrant evil. And then people are all like, you know, housewife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I think that is actually a really, really good spot to leave that right there with the scaring. And we should come back. And talk about um, alignments, because we actually just did an episode on that. Yeah. And uh, oh, I would cool. love to hear the, the early story on, on your life. It's actually our second episode on that. Yeah. I would love to come back and hear about the development of, of the alignments. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. We can, we can talk for another two hours just on my, my love of fantasy alone. Yeah. So, that, yeah. That, that's kind of... <laughs> Kind yeah, of we why we even wanted touched fantasy Robotech. to be its own thing because <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's such a vein to tap. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So do you guys like alignments? Oh yeah. Oh, seriously, has it come out yet? Yeah, it dropped. Uh, yeah, yeah, it dropped uh, like, last week. Yeah, this, this is the best, best to remember to toilet or la or laundry time that you will ever hear about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's within the last three or four episodes. So if you. If you want to take a yeah. listen to it and hear us talk about it, yeah, we just gush about it. It's 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 nuanced. You'll you'll hear it in the episode. We we love it. Yeah, I, I love alignments too. I'm always surprised when people go, "Yeah, hey, alignments." Mm -hmm. and I'm like, they're they're vital. At least the way I run my games, I, mm -hmm. I can't imagine characters without an alignment. Yeah, yeah. And, and we'll talk about that later. Hey, can I give a plug for our current sale? Please, absolutely. absolutely. It, it, this will run till, uh, where's my calendar? It runs to uh, February 13th. We've got our uh, mutants and, and, and ninjas and superhero sale going on. The, the After the Bomb books, uh, which can be used with, with Ninja Turtles, are uh, on sale at half off right now mm -hmm. through next, next Tuesday or Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, all the heroes and limited stuff, and a couple other things are all on sale um, at like thirty percent off. So come on down to the Palladium <laughs> website, and stock up, buy direct from the publisher, buy direct. Absolutely, and we encourage that all the time. Is yeah. like go go there and and get it from them because we want them to continue. Mm -hmm. I yep. appreciate that, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time, and we really look forward to doing this series. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. I just, the, these stories, they, they were so inspiring to us when we see them at the end and the beginning of the books. And we just kind of wanted to get like a, a long timeline of, of the development of, of Palladium books and your personal journey through it. And any anecdotes you care to throw out, we're here for. I could, I could spend an entire several hours talking to you individually about each book mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah <laughs> absolutely well guys it's a pleasure you know npc i love the idea of doing this series I'm so glad. Uh, i'm looking this is great. forward to it yeah well thanks for joining us thanks for joining us excellent everyone uh, and folks, thanks for listening to this. We've got more coming with Kevin joining us on hopefully many, many, many more of these discussions. Uh, we, we we love doing this stuff, as you can tell. We we are all fans and just uh, exploding with joy to talk <laughs> with Kevin. <laughs> so uh, check us out on our Discord if you want to drop by and say hello and tell us your own early stories of playing Palladium games and how they inspired you. And we'd love to hear them. Cool. Good night. Starships, magic, mystic martial arts, romance. All of these can be found in A Cloak of Blades by Isaac Sher. You might have heard my name before. I've done a lot of voiceover work for Breakfast Puppies. And I've recently released my first novel. It's available on Amazon as an ebook and paperback. And you can get it for free if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription. I do hope you'll support my work as you're supporting Breakfast Puppies. And it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Have a good one.
You've been listening to The Glitter Boys, a Palladium Books fan podcast. Glitter Boys, Rifts, the Megaverse, and all other such topics are the property of Kevin Sambita and Palladium Books. Please buy all their stuff and help keep them in print and making more games. You can order directly at palladiumbooks.com, and their entire catalog is available digitally at DriveThruRPG as well. Our opening music is 8-Bit Bass and Lead by Furby Guy from freesound.org. This closing music is Caravana by Philip Gross, available at freemusicarchive.org. All sound effects used are self-made or acquired via Creative Commons Zero License. If you like what you have heard, find us on Twitter and Facebook as The Glitter Boys. That's B-O-I-S. And check us out online at breakfastpuppies.com slash glitterboys. And also join us on the Breakfast Puppies Network Discord at breakfastpuppies.com slash discord. And if you want to help us out, please spread the word and help us build a community. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time. 